Good morning. Welcome. I'm Julie, one of the priests here at Holy Communion. It is a gift to be together in worship. For us to be together in worship, if you're here in person, everything that will hold us together in prayer and word and sacrament will be found in this leaflet. The order of the service is in the white. The readings and announcements are in the yellow. 
feel free to take the yellow home, but please help us recycle and care for Mother Earth and leave the white with, you, with us here. If you are joining us online, we feel your presence and are so grateful that you are with us at this time. To follow along, you can click on the orange button that says Bulletin, and you'll find the whole service there. You can, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, it's in the comments. You'll find the order of worship to pray along together. We are still not allowed to sing, all masked up, but we have a wonderful soloist. All the hymnals, hymns are cited here in the yellow leaflet, so you can follow along either humming, swaying like I do, or quietly reciting the words to yourself. If you're at home, feel free to light your prayer candle at this time as we light the ones at the altar. Again, it's a joy to be together. And now let us take a breath. Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. Heaven is here, and earth, and the space is thin between them. Distance may divide, but Christ's promise unites those of us still bounded by time and those who are now blessed by eternity. Let heaven be glad. Heaven is here, and earth, and the church above and below is one. Peter and the disciples are here, and Paul, Martha, and all the Marys, St. Francis and St. Clair, Mother Teresa, Jonathan Daniels, and Martin Luther King, the saints from far back and those who left us not long ago, and only sight prevents us from seeing them, for they are one with us on the other side. Let heaven be glad. Heaven is here, and earth, and God who made them is present. The Lamb, glorious on the throne, sits beside us. The Spirit of God, the Dove, makes her resting place among us. God inhales the breath of our prayers and spreads a table for our satisfaction. Let heaven be glad. Let us sing in honor and glory and power be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Father, not my mother. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone throwing demons out in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Jesus replied, Don't stop him. No one who does powerful acts in my name can quickly turn around and curse me. Whoever isn't against us is for us. I assure you that whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will certainly be rewarded. As for whoever causes these little ones who believe in me to trip and fall into sin, it would be better for them to have a huge stone hung around their necks and to be thrown into the lake. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter into life crippled than to go away, two, than to go away with two hands into the fire of hell, which can't be put out. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, chop it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter God's kingdom with one eye than to be thrown into hell with two. That's the place where worms don't die and the fire never goes out. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? Maintain salt among yourselves and keep peace with each other. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. the one true and loving God who makes us salty. Amen. Please be seated. This is a tricky gospel, uh, and we're in the midst of a short creation season in the church, and Christians all over the world are praying. Um, we're invited to pray in these Sundays leading up to St. Francis's feast next week for our human relationship to the rest of creation. Relationship is key to these readings. So I'm going to spend more time there than with some of the gory verses. I'll cover them a little bit, but today's gospel gets at a fundamental tension in our understanding of relationships. In today's gospel, John comes to Jesus to tell him, Teacher, we saw someone throwing out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. There are echoes from what we read from the book of Numbers of Moses having his authority questioned and there are these folks preaching without license. And John, when he comes up to Jesus, is expecting a thank you. He wants Jesus to know he had his back. John thinks he's done well. And Jesus surprises John. Jesus inverts the usual saying, if you're not with me, you're against me. No, Jesus says, whoever isn't against us is for us. For Jesus, the way that the disciples and the way that we today have been taught about relationship is problematic. The way we've been taught to compete and count insiders and outsiders, it won't work if you want to follow Jesus. We spend quite a bit of time in our modern day worried about our private relationships, and this gospel isn't about family systems. This section of Mark is all about public relationship. Jesus asks his disciples to relate differently than they were taught by society, with ethnic outsiders and children and the poor. Jesus invites his disciples to radically redefine relationships, 
with power, with money, with faith, with government, with rivals. Relationships have power. How are we related? What does this have to do with creation? Now, when I was in college, the Native American activist Winona Leduc broke open my sense of relationship and creation. Leduc gave a lecture at my university and introduced our class to the Iroquois understanding, which has come to permeate a lot of Native activism around ecology. The Iroquois have a teaching about the seven generations. Maybe you've heard it. For the Iroquois, any decision, especially a decision about natural resources or land, must consider the impact to the seventh generation. This indigenous understanding it can be read in tribal opposition uh, to things like the Dakota Access Pipeline. The people of Standing Rock, albeit of a different tribe, but they applied this same principle in North Dakota, and they opposed the construction through their land, through their water sources, of a pipeline, because they considered that at some point down the generations, in the lifetime perhaps of their great, 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 great grandchildren, the pipe could leak into Lake Oahe or the Mississippi or Missouri rivers. How will this decision impact future generations? The teaching has been common. It's become a common yardstick for many indigenous ecological activists. And maybe it's because I have a kid now but this question of our relationship with younger generations, it's starting to weigh on me. In London, in Warsaw, in Mexico, cities across our globe on Friday, young people, many of them 20 plus years younger than me, marched to raise awareness of climate change. I look at those young people and I think, I haven't done enough. I haven't done enough. Those are tricky words in church. Sometimes we say a confession around here and we confess the things we have done and the things we have left undone. And part of the reason that we're so stuck on questions like this is that they have more to do with relationship than our individualistic society often lets us think. And part of the reason we're so stuck on questions of fossil fuel and pollution is that we tend to treat the problem as an individual problem. I remember when we were all supposed to calculate our carbon footprint? And gosh, I could get all worked up trying to reduce, reuse, recycle, and bicycle my way to a smaller impact on the planet. But in recent years, listening to friends who know far more than I do about these questions, I've learned that me doing my little part at home isn't enough. Climate change and the ecological crises that come with it aren't solvable on the individual level. We have to think more corporately. We have to think more corporately. Those are some dangerous words in this pulpit. It's a pretty easy thing to turn this now. It'd be easy for me to turn it into a tirade against evil corporations sure. or government, and I've probably preached a version of that sermon before. But friends, part of the difficulty is the myth that we've woven around corporations. We treat companies as if they're something more than they are. Corporations are people. And I don't mean that in the way the Supreme Court ruled around political speech. Corporations are people, plural. They're made up of people. To incorporate means to make a body. All of us belong to corporate bodies. Whether as members of a church, a nonprofit, or employees of a business, residents of a certain neighborhood, voters in a district, we are all relentlessly incorporated. It makes you hear that second part of the gospel about what you do with parts of the body that are causing you to stumble a little bit differently. To actually make a difference for our planet, we have to pay attention to our corporate relationships. We have to cultivate them. If you want to make a difference for the planet, you might need to volunteer your time for the ethics committee at work, 
pushing to get your workplace to investigate the ethical sourcing of materials. You might need to show up at a community meeting to talk about the environmental impact of a local government decision around our sewer system or a proposed construction project. I know it's rough. We have to sit around the table with other people. Who is it that said hell is other people? Here at my workplace at your church, we're going to need some help with these questions. I'm looking for volunteers. Big surprise. I'm always looking for volunteers. But with the question of climate, did you know that this church spends $10,000 a year on electricity? $10,000 a year. That's so much more carbon than my home. We've been talking for years now about getting solar panels, and I think it's time we get serious. And I think they should be big and ugly and visible from the street. And more importantly, they should come with a big tacky sticker on our windows telling our neighbors who they can call to get solar panels at their home or business. To do this work now on solar, we're going to need money, sure. But probably more than that, we're going to need volunteers to give their time to meet together on Zoom or around a table. Because it takes relationships to move corporate systems, even little ones like this one. Relationships matter in faith. I think it's easy to forget this because we have over-personalized almost everything in our society. We have over-individualized. It's certainly true of faith. How often have you heard the phrase, my relationship to God, or my relationship to Jesus, my personal walk? It's because of this over-individualization that we struggle with that big paragraph in the gospel about plucking out eyes and severing limbs. Please don't take that literally or personally. Jesus is talking rhetorically. Jesus is asking people to tend to their relationships. He's saying it's okay to release relationship with people who cause harm. That's all. It's still painful because relationships matter. A friend, a wiser priest than me, just started as the rector of a big church down south. I watched her first forum in the parish, a big Q&A. And an earnest parishioner asked his new rector, essentially, what do we do about the people who have gotten so comfortable worshiping from home in their pajamas? How do we get them back? I say this priest is wiser than me because she didn't immediately go to a defensive place. And she didn't immediately start out with a reactive defense of in-person worship. She paused. And she noticed her own experience when she wasn't busy leading worship on a Sunday morning. She said that at first, she was very dedicated to signing in right on time, right at 8 or 10.30, to being very attentive. But as the pandemic dragged on, she noticed that sometimes she was vacuuming during church or doing other housework while listening on her earbuds. She says, I'm sure I was alone in this. <laughs> but then she said, you can denigrate that, or you can notice there's something powerful about worshiping from home. Uh, for the first time, for many of us, church was literally meeting people exactly where they were. And we don't want to lose that. And then she said something that I found really compelling. Don't lose that it's powerful to church, for church to meet where you are. But she said, I hope everyone who is still at home, everyone who's still at home hears from someone who knows them from church. I miss seeing you. I miss spending time with you. I miss praying with you. Look, friends, we discovered something that some of us clergy wanted to keep a secret in the pandemic. It's this. You can worship God anywhere. You can encounter God anywhere. Yes, we believe God is really present in the Eucharist here at the altar. But we believe that the bread is a sacrament, a symbol which breaks open God's presence everywhere. 
God is everywhere, even when we're vacuuming. You don't need to come to church to find God. But this is where we find God together, in all the mess, in all the frustration, in all the joy that comes in relationship. So if you haven't seen someone in a while, notice. Drop them a note, a text, make a phone call. If you haven't come in a while and you're at home in your pajamas, don't feel guilty, but know we miss you. We look forward to seeing you again. Relationships matter. At the risk of going on too long, let me introduce one more twist to this discussion before I sit down. I've been thinking a great deal about relationship and church these days, you can probably tell. For more than a century, we have counted how many people worshiped in Sunday, on Sunday mornings in person with us. It's the only count that matters as far as the national con church concerns. We would have to submit it every year, average Sunday attendance in our forms. And frankly, friends, we were doing well, and I probably got a bit prideful about it. For five years, we grew. And in 2020, in March of 2020, we were getting close to 200 people on a Sunday here. We hadn't seen those numbers since the 1960s. I was proud. I don't know when or if we will count that many people that way again. But as I read today's gospel, I think Jesus wouldn't want us to be anxious about counting insiders. And Jesus doesn't want his followers to drive away people doing good work because they're not card-carrying members. Jesus cares more about the healing the world needs. And so I find myself wondering, as we take timid steps toward what is next for us, how can we broaden our sense of who counts? Can our churches worry less about growing an arbitrary number of people who show up on a Sunday morning to a building? And can we put more energy into growing relationships that can transform lives? Relationships that can transform neighborhoods? Relationships that can have the power to transform our planet? I've caught glimpses. In the thick of the pandemic, I watched as volunteers from this church got together, organized themselves on social media, and supported voters waiting in long lines to vote last November. I've seen folks invite friends to join with them as our church marched in LGBTQ plus pride or in a rally for sensible gun control. How do we start counting more of the people who aren't against us? How do we walk together and be for God's justice together, even with folks who might not name it the same way we do? In order to have the power to make the kind of change our world so desperately needs, we have to grow our community. What relationships could we activate to work to make life better seven generations down the road? What if we worried less in the church about counting insiders and more about how we could work together for the healing of our planet? Amen. Thank you. 
give our thanks. Give our thanks. we can through a text a phone call a note and to each other let us pass the peace of Christ the peace of Christ be always with you and also with you peace everybody Warm welcome to Holy Communion. Please be seated for a couple brief announcements. Warm welcome to Holy Communion. We're so glad you're here, whether you're with us in person or online. Your presence swells our worship. In any case, uh, you'll find a great deal of announcements at our website, holycommunion.net backslash info. The ones we had space for, we um, printed on the back of the leaflet as well. Uh, importantly, today, whether it's online or here in person, in the entryway to my left, your right, uh, there's a newsletter available, our fall newsletter. There is more news in this newsletter than I think has ever been in a church newsletter ever. Um, and it's big news. There are a lot of transitions going on in our life. Our junior warden, Warren, junior warden Warren, uh, will be following his spouse, Emily, as she becomes the rector of the Church of the Advent in Crestwood. And Warren, we're going to miss you around here. Um, but read about that. Warren wrote a really lovely letter to the parish. Um, and we're just very excited for Warren and Emily. Our priest associate, Mark Smith, and his spouse are moving to my home state of Colorado, and we're going to be celebrating Mark on the 24th of October. Uh, our um, children's formation coordinator, Heidi, is taking the next steps in her vocation. All of that and more is in the newsletter. There's also some exciting news. Josephine, who just read our Prayers of the People, is joining us this semester as our seminarian. Uh, she's been working on her Master's in Divinity in Eden, and we're really looking forward to working with her. And, though he was playing last week, and he played back in August as well, 
I'm really excited to introduce you to your new organist, Stephen Cook. Uh, yeah. Read Stephen's bio. It is a coup that we landed Stephen as our organist. Um, and it's great that he, I said in my letter, he's going to fit in so well with our slightly zany choir when they're able to come back. So we're just really glad to have you, Stephen. We'll be doing a big um, recital and uh, reception for Stephen a little bit later on this fall. As you heard in the Praise of the People, um, Mary Chapman, our music director, uh, lost her mom on Friday. Uh, we will be posting on the church's social media uh, when the details are public for the service and the visitation, which will all be next weekend. And again, we'll put those out on our Facebook and our Twitter from the church. If you don't Facebook or Twitter, you can call the office a little bit later this week when those details are public, and we will um, let you know how you can support Mary. But she's really grateful for your prayers at this time. There is a lot going on in our life. There are lots of ways to get involved here at Holy Communion. Next Sunday is the Feast of St. Francis. We will have a service at 4 p.m. with Blessing of the Animals out in the park. That is always a great deal of fun. It'll be even more fun out there in the park. Uh, and we'll be able to have more room and space and people, a lot of fun, 4 o'clock. Uh, we also will have another 4 o'clock service on the 24th of October as a farewell for Mark and some of the others who are on their way out. We hope you'll join us for that. It happens to be Mark's birthday on the 24th of October, so we thought that would be a good um, final day for him around here. Uh, but there's a lot going on. You can always get involved through our garden ministry, which meets 6 o'clock in the garden behind the church on Gannon, uh, behind the house on Gannon between us. Uh, we run those gardens and we um, produce produce for folks who are food insecure in our region. Uh, our laundry love ministry is a way to get involved. It's the third Tuesday of every month. Our um, centering prayer group is getting together now, hybrid, in person and online. You can either sign in on Zoom or if you're vaccinated, show up here in person. Uh, we had a nice gathering here in the parish hall at seven o'clock. Again, all that and more at holycommunion.net backslash info. In the before times, at this point in the service, we would pass the plates, and we still can't do that safely, and a big chunk of our congregation isn't here to pass the plates, too. We're, we've broadened to online. Uh, so we'd invite you, if you are here in person and want to make a physical offering, there is a um, wooden box, an offering box, on the welcome table just over here to your right on your way out. We encourage that, but we appreciate your generosity. Um, you can give online at any time at holycommunion.net backslash info or backslash give. Uh, and you can text using what should be appearing on your screen or the information in your bulletin. Again, it's your generosity that keeps this place going, and we really thank you. What follows is the Lord's Supper, and as such, it doesn't belong to us. It's not the Episcopal Church's table. It's not um, my table. It's God's table. At God's table, all people are welcome. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, you are welcome to receive the bread made holy. When it does come time, um, we have only been doing communion here at 1030 for a couple weeks now. So as a reminder, we would ask you to form a single file line up the middle of the center aisle. I know in the before times we did two uh, lines, but for the sake of social distancing, we ask you to follow the arrows coming this way, um, single file, and then go to the priest on your side of the congregation, and then follow the arrows on the side aisles back to your pew when it's time. It'll just help with the flow and help everybody keep that six feet. Um, thank you so much. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We praise you and we bless you. 
holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, and yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came from, for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now, gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior, Christ, has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Jesus walked in 
his lonesome valley. He had to walk he by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it Amen. for him. He had to walk he by himself. We must walk this lonesome valley. We have to walk he by ourselves. So nobody else could walk it for us. We have to walk by ourselves. We must clasp our hands together. We have to clasp them in the air. Nobody else can clasp them for us. We have to clasp them by ourselves. We must lift our hearts to heaven. We have to walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk him by ourselves. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it Let us pray. God of abundance, you, you have fed, fed us, us with, with the, the bread, bread of life and cup of salvation. Us. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior, Amen. Live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road, and may God's blessing be always with you. Amen. Amen.
feel really back now because I'm remembering an announcement I should have done before, and that feels like I'm actually back from sabbatical. Um, there is an important other announcement. It's available online at holycommunion.net backslash info. But next Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 2nd of October, uh, there will be a public memorial for all who have died of COVID-19 in our St. Louis region. Uh, the primary organizer is our own Rebecca Messbarger. Uh, again, the details are all up online. It'll be near the Grand Basin, uh, but you want to go to the website to get exact directions and parking and all things like that. Our bishop is one of the speakers. The mayor of St. Louis, Tashara Jones, is one of the speakers. And Tracy Blackman, who's truly one of the greatest preachers in our country right now, not just our region, is one of the primary speakers. Members of our choir are participating in what promises to be amazing music. Um, but it's an important thing to mark what we've been through, what we are continuing to go through. Uh, so I'd invite you to consider joining us on Saturday evening in Forest Park. Chester. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Ha, 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 ha. 